Thanks, Cindy. Thank you everyone for allowing me to be here today. Before I start recording for the podcast, I would like to acknowledge that um, I'm joining from the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Those are the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. It's recently known as Victoria, BC, Canada. So I'm way far away from Cindy. And uh, I give so much thanks and praise to um, the internet for connecting us together. Um, you know, as a, as a Gen X baby who really only became exposed to the internet as I was graduating high school, you know, the internet's like pretty new actually. Um, but I know that if I had had Cindy's books at that time, um, even before the internet, I would have been that person writing her letters and sending her gifts, and, you know, writing to the editor to be like, how can I connect with Cindy? And so, um, I'm so grateful to be here and I'm grateful for the the um, powers that have made our paths cross. Mm -hmm. And I'd invite everyone to just take a moment to connect with the spirits of place in the land where you are just for a moment to acknowledge whose land are you on right now. You could do that just by feeling your seat or your feet or looking out the window. And I often then like to take a moment um, to acknowledge that, you know, this isn't a somatic practice. This is a reconciliation practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just doing this to like calm myself, but to actually locate myself. So what are the identities and um, uh, lineages that I carry to the land that I'm on? So I'd invite everyone to just take a few breaths and acknowledge maybe your ancestors or identities you carry um, that you bring to the land where you are. Beautiful. And you're welcome to share in the text chat. We do our land spirits, ancestors in place on the full moon. We have a okay. different se st senior student who does the research. And, you know, so we honor a different um, Indigenous or First Nations group on the full moon every month. Oh, I love that. Thanks yeah. for sharing that. That's a wonderful idea. So I'm going to start, and I'll also provide context for folks who've uh, never heard my podcast, the Numinous Podcast. It's been running since 2014. I have almost 200 uh, episodes. There's been like some years of lots of productivity and other years where it's a bit quiet, but this will be Cindy's third time, I think, on the podcast. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm getting up there in terms of return guests, which I don't do very often. So very exciting. So uh, I'm going to start recording, and then I, I always start with the first um, the same first question. And even when it's a guest that's been on before, you know, our identities shift and change. So it's always really fun to hear it again. Okay, let's get going. Okay. So Cindy, what identities do you lead with now? Well, Carmen, since the last time we talked on your fabulous podcast, um, Something that, what identities I lead with now, I think I just did an episode on the Keeping Her Keys podcast with the amazing Coyote May on uh, Hecate, gender and queerness. So I have been thinking a lot about my place at that crossroads and that intersection. Um, so I, I would say like, my queerness and thinking about gender is kind of what I've been leading with personally. Um, and then, of course, um, having a new book come out, the author identity comes back to the surface because it's been a few years since I've had a book come out. So right now, I think those two are big. Um, and uh, I think you might be able to relate to this one personally as well. My youngest son is soon graduating high school. So uh, the motherhood role is changing. So those are the three big ones for me right now. Mm. It may have been a few years since one of your books came out, but honestly, you've had a, you, it's been busy the last few years. You have keeping her keys, and then we were in entering Hecate's garden, and now here we are for entering Hecate's cave. These three books seem to be guiding us along a larger narrative arc, but maybe there's more too. So, so 
just for folks who are new to your work, uh, how do you see these three books fitting together? Thanks for asking that question, because since um, Hecate's Cave came out a couple of weeks ago, that's been one of the most popular questions that I've been asked, like, where, which book do I start with? Is there an order? And they're three really interrelated books, but very different books. So the Keeping Her Keys book, um, I call it an introduction to Hecate's modern witchcraft, and it is a survey of different personal development techniques merged with ritual um, and some natural magic and, of course, uh, devotion to the great goddess Hecate herself. So that book gives you a little bit of everything. The second book, Entering Hecate's Garden, is my offering to the green world um, mm. and the practice of uh, what I would call holistic herbalism that combines magic as well as the um, physiological and psychological applications of different plants. So it contains monographs for 39 different botanicals and um, also sections on kind of the deeper side of plants, more into working with the spirits of the plants, and then also quite a bit on practical applications of working with plants. And then the new book um, really is my, I want to call it my testament, uh, you know, it's my testament to my own journey. It's um, an offering to my students that I've taught over the years. And it is really um, like a form of devotion to Hecate as well. You know, there's, I feel like there is so much of me and my journey um, in entering Hecate's cave. And it is really that deep dive into merging psychology with uh, Hecate and the deeper world of spirits and natural magic and so on. So in terms of like, which book should you begin with? I would say begin with the book that has the most uh, vitality for you. You know, if you are called to deep shadow healing and you have survived significant trauma in your life, uh, perhaps entering Hecate's cave will help you. Uh, of course, it doesn't replace therapy or other forms of treatment. Um, if you are just curious about Hecate, the Keeping Her Keys book is really great because it gives you a little bit of everything. I designed it as a course that you can work at over a year. Um, and then if you, like me, love the spirits of the green world and really want to reconnect uh, to plants and your natural magic, then entering Hecate's garden is for you. But there is a, you're right, there is a larger story. I am spinning book by book, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, certainly for me, a lot of it is about revisiting ancient mythology and practices um, surrounding the goddess Hecate and other mythic figures associated with her, like Medea and Circe in, uh, Hecate's cave, it's really centered around Persephone and Demeter and Hecate as another trio. So for me, a lot of it is reaching through the mists of time to revisit these stories and find, you know, the psycho spiritual aspects of the stories that we identify with as a mechanism for connecting to what's so much greater than us, but also lives inside of us. Those are the keys. <laughs> is there a clue for those of us who are big fans and have been for a while in the the motif of the trio and the two books having matching color covers? Is there a third that goes with them? There could be. <laughs> <laughs> is that all you're going to tell, tell us? <laughs> There is definitely a third book uh, in the works, although um, I may take a sidestep and write a slightly different book first. We'll see how the year goes. Mm -hmm. um, Entering Hecate's Cave was a long time coming, and I may need a little bit of a break from book writing. Mm, I hear that. That that actually makes sense for the year that we're in right now. 
you know, we're in a chariot year, we're in a seven year, it's kind of like, here's the end of a cycle. And so maybe, maybe there's a pause, but I, I know that those of us who are aware of, well, you have four books actually all together, but th that these two seem to, to be building something. And I'm very curious about the, um, sort of the emergent or the reborn queen archetype, which I'm going to ask you about uh, near the end of our interview. But uh, we'll revisit this question because I know longtime fans want to know more. <laughs> I, I suspect you know where I'm going. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, your books, uh, you know, certainly were lifting up um, Hecate, but there's something, it's, you know, very personal. It seems as, a, as we're reading these books and we arrive at entering Hecate's cave, it's true that you're sharing more of you yourself, but what is important to you personally about representing Hecate well? You know, she's been, you, a lot of the books spend a lot of the time and particularly this one talking about how she's been misrepresented and how you, and how there are so many facets to her that you're trying to illuminate, not just the shadow aspects that have been so distorted by the patriarchy. Why is that so important to you that she in particular is represented very well? This, this is such a great question. And I don't have like a kind of cognitively developed, well thought out Gemini style answer for that. I have a very Scorpio ascendant. She called me, I answered, it feels right, and I do it. That's my <laughs> answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, whenever I can usurp the patriarchy um, and I, you know, uh, I enjoy what deeper the deeper world. I found healing there. I love writing about it. Um, and, you know, I think if we did want to psychologize this a bit, I think from my own journey, feeling unheard and misunderstood, you know, I think there are parallels there. And, you know, my work um, in academia and in healthcare, so many stories of many women because I worked a lot in women's health, but also many others who are marginalized, how their stories too are often um, twisted into a narrative by the power structure. And so perhaps part of what I'm doing is rectifying how I feel that so many of us have been wronged. Um, and Hecate is an amazing spirit to connect with when we feel that we have been you know, denied, marginalized, uh, criminalized, all of these things, because not only is she very powerful as a force, but that she also knows what it's like. Mm -hmm. Can you remember a specific time, maybe when you were working in women's health or um, when that was happening, when you were misunderstood or being um, distorted somehow? And if, if the present day you who's been walking with Hecate for a long time could go back and say something to earlier you with a message is there is there a scene that you can remember where you, you would go back now and like whisper in your own ear to help you through that there are many and I think a lot of us um, especially maybe women of a certain age but many others as well too um, you know when I was in when I was an undergrad, I was like a young single mother and a very non-traditional student. This is back in the 90s, very non-traditional to be a young single mother, um, had a, a high demand child who, you know, needed me and, and I was working and doing all of this and going to school. So I think when I went back to university in that context, my whole experience was often very othering um and in particular the, the i'm gonna just tell you I, the thing that comes to my mind carmen and this professor is deceased so i'm going to speak ill of the dead um but this particular professor who was the department chair in the psychology department where i did my training had this 
cartoon on his office door. Take a breath. Just take a breath here for a minute. Okay, everybody take a breath. He had this cartoon on his office door, and it was a picture of a gingerbread man, you know, like the cookie, mm -hmm. with his crotch bit out of him. Oh, it gets better when I'm not done. And on the edge of the bed, there was a witch, you know, in the stereotypical Halloween garb, eating the cookie. Mm -hmm. And if I could go back and visit that younger Cindy, I would, instead of saying anything to her, I would rip that F and cartoon off that door. Because here we are, 25, 30 years later, I still think about that cartoon. Mm -hmm. I, and maybe everyone who's listening or watching can relate to having those kind of experiences when it's just like who you are at your soul is vilified in a joking way. Um, and just how, how completely powerless I felt in that moment. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't rip the thing off the door and I would go back and rip that thing off the door. Would you help me, Carmen? Would you, would you watch oh, down the hallway and make sure nobody saw me? Oh no. I'd knock on the door. We'd open it. I'd pull it off, hand it to you and you would rip it in front of his face and throw it down. Okay. <laughs> yes. Do it. Yes, we would right in front of him. That's right. <laughs> Exactly. See, even uh, now I carry some residual fear in that, well, then I would get kicked out of the program. Mm -hmm. He had and a so, right to be offensive. I did not have a right to be offended. Right. Exactly. Which aspect of Hecate would you call on for that, that fear to help you? I would call on uh, Brimo. B R I M O, which means fierce, terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, there really isn't an English word equivalent of Brimo, but if you say Brimo and perhaps soften your gaze into your candle, you can feel her. She is that rightful anger, you know, we carry. She is that fierce one. She is that moment when your loved ones are threatened and you will do anything to save them. You know, that is the spirit of Brimo. Rima was sorely lacking then. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for invoking her now in this moment, but also um, through these books. So, yeah, let's go back to the 90s a little bit. Uh, you know, I think we are not now, but hopefully entering the age of nuance. <laughs> where, you know, we, we recognize that there's like none of our icons are perfect they're all imperfect. Uh, as we become more aware of capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist, patriarchy, now we like see how we've been so conditioned by it in so many ways. Um, but I will say that there are aspects of the books that I read in the 90s that, that are still very dear to me. And in this book, Entering Hecate's Cave, more than once you quote from James Hillman's book, uh, The Dream in the Underworld, which was so formative for me. And it's a book I actually picked up maybe three years ago, like found a paperback in a little free library and like picked up again and was like, yeah, no, this guy was great. <laughs> you know, like still love him. Um, and uh, in my blurb uh, on your book, I, I place you in that lineage, maybe actually for folks who don't already have the book, I'll um, read a bit of my blurb, which is, um, with entering Hecate's cave, Dr. Brandon has firmly placed herself among the great psycho-spiritual researchers and teachers of our time. This book can rest proudly on the shelf alongside titles by Jean Shinoda Bolin, Marion Woodman, and James Hillman. With this work, Brandon secures her place and Hecate's among the best resources for trauma-sensitive and spiritually oriented healing for our times. I've said it before, I say it again, I really do mean that. As I was reading this book, I kept thinking, you know, um, Goddesses and Every Woman by Jean Shinoda Bolin. I, even more than your other two Hecatean um, titles, this one, I was like, yeah, this, and I read that in high school, you know, 1991 or something like that. If it, if each one of those goddesses had had somebody researching and telling her story, like this is what this, these books feel very much in that lineage. Um, so as great as all those, uh, psycho-spiritual 
authors and therapists are, what do you think they missed that Hecate really wanted to make sure that you carried into this present time and the coming decades? Like, what do you hope to add to this lineage of psycho-spiritual therapy with your work? Oh, wow. That's such a great question. Where do I kind of find my space in that question? Um, I read those books too, back in the nineties and early two thousands. And I really wanted to revisit them because I felt like that lineage has kind of fallen out of like a more popular discourse that although um, spirituality in general, we have so many books now, um, paganism, witchcraft, there's so many books and I certainly haven't read them all, but when I kind of surveyed what was available about Hecate, um, there, I felt that something was missing that I wanted, which was that deeper understanding. And so I, uh, went back to a book that had been so healing for me called the dark night of the soul by Thomas Moore. And in that book, if you haven't read the dark night of the soul, my friends, you need to read that book. Um, so Thomas Moore way back in the day when that book came out, he was on Oprah. <laughs> um, and I read the book for the first time then, and, you know, probably didn't pay much attention to the passage on Hecate it was interested, but not really, um, took much notice of it. And, and then when I probably 15 years ago, like I revisited that book and then I discovered that Thomas Moore was James Hillman's best friend. Did you know that? I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm explains gonna to a lot, doesn't it? The soul off the shelf and yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. It does explain a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and then so I went back to James Hillman and really started to understand the dream of the underworld. And at the same time, you know, I'd been doing more research on Hecate and kind of stumbled into the Hecate of the Neoplatonic philosophers of like Proclus and in the Chaldean oracles where Hecate was anima mundi, soul of the world. She was this great mediating force um, and all the beauty that I found there and so I felt like there was a lot missing, although Hillman certainly approached that um, in different books, not just this book, but he has another book on anima. Um, I felt there was a lot of ground that didn't get covered. And I also had this, and it might be a personal bias, but even like I love uh, Jean Shinolda Bolin's work. And in The Goddesses and Older Women, she does talk about Hecate, but I kind of felt like she was missing the boat a little bit. Mm. And then um, in my study of in-depth psychology and, you know, like in Jungian psychology and how they talk about myths and archetypes and all of this, I always kind of felt like a little affronted. Um, you know, they either didn't leave out Hecate or they talked about Hecate as she was like, I call her Macbeth's Hecate. Right. Mm -hmm. Or she was Macbeth's Hecate. And often in depth psychology and Jungian psychology, the archetype of the witch is treated the same way. Mm -hmm. And all of the beauty of uh, witchcraft as a, like a healing path um, for wholeness and for healing others, really, I didn't see a lot of that in those books. And certainly, I and Hecate tended to be very kind of flatlined. Um, and at the same time, you know, I had done this research and discovered that there was a lot more to Hecate than what was kind of being presented within psychology, but also presented in like paganism and witchy books and New Age books. However, like Thomas Moore and James Hillman got her right. Um, and I thought that was very interesting. And so I wanted to write a book that was certainly like an homage to James Hillman um, and the great Marion Woodman. But even Marion Woodman, I've listened to so many of her audio recordings and you can get them on Audible. 
So I've listened to hours and hours of her audio recordings and, you know, she never kind of goes all the way into the cave. Mm. And I know, you know, in terms of therapy, like um, a Jungian or another type of analyst in that kind of occupation, they might say, well, you can't go safely deep unless it's one on one. And, you know, through my teaching of the course that this book is based on, which is known as Lampadia, which means basically the lamp bearer, or the torch bearer, I knew like we, there are ways to safely apply this because, you know, my training is as an applied social psychologist. So this is what my career has been is taking things from therapy um, and finding aspects of it and reinventing it in a way that people who don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to spend on this type of therapy that they can still benefit. So, you know, that was kind of like just coming together and wanting to really honor the lineage of Marion Woodman in particular and James Hill in as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and also this might be a little like kind of coming in, uh, we're, we're inviting this, an unexpected spirit into the room, but also um, Elena Blavatsky. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you look at her work and what she did, and she is definitely like one of my spiritual ancestors that I honor, mm -hmm. that she's so misunderstood and misrepresented. Even during her lifetime, she became vilified and, you know, was the, the target of a real witch hunt, mm -hmm. you know, to prove that she was a fraud. However, as a philosopher, as a theosophist, as a thinker, as an innovator, she brought to the Western mind so much that today is so embedded in our culture and she never is acknowledged um, as the one who brought these ideas to the West. For example, mm -hmm. yoga. Mm -hmm. You know, she was really involved in bringing yoga to the West. Uh, and most of us love our yoga. So, you know, for me, it was part of this is honoring those spirits that I feel have been somewhat um unacknowledged mm -hmm. in a very more open way this is why i wanted to include like quotes um you know i start my my um opening acknowledgements like i include a quote from a theosophist because i wanted i wanted intentionally to bring that energy into what i was doing mm -hmm. and then i of course honor uh woodman and hillman and uh, thomas moore who is still alive and well in writing his books um, but I wanted to bring their spirits into that book because I think they have, there's a depth there. And in terms of like theosophy, there is a, a depth of the way they think about the nature of the universe and human experience that to me harkens back to what those ancient Neoplatonic philosophers like Proclus and the authors of the Chaldean oracles and others, what they were trying to explore and examine from their perspective 2000 years ago, which in some ways was different than ours, but in some ways not. We are still trying to understand the nature of our existence and trying to uh, find a way to be our whole selves, to be whole onto ourselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that dimensionality that you bring really stands out to me that, that, you know, those writers that we just cited may have mentioned Hecate, but it was always in a shadow aspect uh, as ugly, distorted, contorted, like a um, something aversive. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you bring is that depth, that dimensionality, all these facets that it seems to me Hecate as a misunderstood being it would be really important to set the record straight. <laughs> so it's, and, and much as I, I, you know, I love James Hillman, Thomas Moore as well. Those are very, you know, I, I still talk about the oakness of the acorn from <laughs> learning that notion from James Hillman in, when I was a teenager. So this is no disrespect, but it's like they spoke to the extent that they can 
Mm -hmm. someone being misunderstood or somebody having a dimensionality unrecognized by the the culture you know like I, I just think as like you know kind of privileged white man people with lots of uh education um they and success you know a lot of uh, validation by <laughs> you know in multiple spheres of society there are aspects of Hecate that they just can't, like can't touch or can't reach in the same way that somebody who say was a single mom in academia in the 90s as a young mom um, can. So that dimensionality really leaps off the page. Um, I, I, I do want to stick a little bit with a section here where you are uh, quoting James Hillman from Dream in the Underworld and uh, talk about um, Hecate, the filth eater. So he writes, the junk of the soul is primordially saved by Hecate's blessing, and even our thra trashing ourselves can be led back to her. The messy life is a way of entering her domain and becoming a child of Hecate. Our part is only to recognize that there is myth in the mess, so as to dispose of the daily residues at the proper place, that is to place them at Hecate's altar. And then you go on, you link from that, you bridge to um, catharsis and healing and talk about Hecate as the filth eater is one face of the great mother who accepts our waste. Then you're talking about miasma and um, kind of dealing with the dirt and facing our shadow. And then you lead into um, shame as my asthma and the, the hidden infection and the aspect Borbara Forba, um, who is a willing consumer of this insidious disease of shame. Akin to shame is that sense of um, vulnerability and being seen. I'm not worthy. I'm not ready. Who am I to write a book like this? Who am I to, to become a Hecatean researcher and scholar? I imagine I'm projecting onto you, uh, but I'm very curious. Um, what rituals do, do you invoke when you hit that edge <laughs> where, where um, in your pursuit of success, you meet some kind of hidden shame. Maybe you thought you dealt with, <laughs> you know. And so how does this aspect of Hecate, the filth eater, still show up for you no matter the level of success you attain? Oh, this is such a delightful question. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, so Barbara Forba is, comes from a, a, a collection of magical and ritual fragments known as the Greek Magical Papyri. And um, like Brimo, when we say Babora Forba, there is a vitality to it that travels across the centuries. And even if you don't know what Babora Forba means, when you say it, you can feel its power. So that is one of the chapter titles from this book. Um, for me, it's interesting because where I teach the ritual cycle in my school, um, every fall when we do this ritual, which um, Scorp is the Scorpio new moon, um, you know, I spend lots of time in advance, of course, prepping for this and doing my own catharsis work. And, you know, it's an ongoing process. There are layers. I would say, you know, a lot of the things that I used to be resentful of, be really wounded by, um, you know, from my past, from the upbringing that I had, I don't carry any of those things anymore. But, you know, when there are still things that light up for me, like the gingerbread man with his lack of crotch and the witch eating it, you know, they don't carry the same um, gravity that they had 20 years ago, but I do, you know, there are issues around shame that I certainly struggle with. Body image um, has been a big one my whole life. And even now I will catch myself. There was something funny the other day. So I, we have, I have a hot tub. I'm fortunate enough to have a hot tub. Live here in the country. Hot tub is in like a barn like structure. It's not even outside. There's no one here to see me. And I recently I was in the hot tub and I was doing things a certain way as though someone was watching me. And then I had the 
I was like, there is absolutely no one here, Cindy. <laughs> like, it's you, the deer, the bobcat, which I am afraid of the bobcat. Um, you know, there's enough. me in the wildlife. <laughs> there's no one here. Um, and then I, so for me, I've really been exploring, like, that sense of being self-conscious, mm. which I think is so connected to shame. You know, it's like, because when we've been othered a lot in our lives, so me, I've always been really short and curvy. That's my natural state of being. Um, and, you know, that can lead to a lot of othering. And so I still, you know, it's like, how can I be less self-conscious? It's kind of where I'm landing in my own shame journey now. Mm. Because shame is like, shame is like that visceral acute pain. Um, and you know this as a somatic practitioner, like we hold it in our bodies mm -hmm. and, you know, it just is such a weight. Um, and then I think for me, as that is lightened, it's become this awareness of being self-conscious and I really don't want to be self-conscious anymore. You know, if I'm out in the world, I don't want to think, um, I don't want to think about like how I'm presenting myself out in the world. I just want to present myself the way I want to present myself and then not think, you know, when a new book comes out, it's like, you know, what are the right things to say to promote it? Um, you know, like all of those kind of things. And with this book coming out, you know, I've just really been, I'm just going to be a hundred percent honest and authentic um, and kind of lead with what's really important to me. I did this really goofy unboxing video. I don't know if you saw, did you see that? I goofy? did. Yeah, it was cute. <laughs> In my pajamas. Genuine. And I, because, you know, it's like, well, do you need to be like serious Dr. Cindy for people to take your very serious book seriously? <laughs> and then I thought, I don't believe that. I believe my readers and followers and students and the people listening to your podcast are very intelligent and they know that we're multidimensional and, you know, um, people like you and I who do this very serious work, they, they know that we're not just super serious all the time. Um, helping people heal from their trauma, that sometimes we can be goofy too. Totally. And that, totally. So that's why, you know, I wasn't going to share it. And then, I, you know, like the publicist, I'm like, what's what would the publicist say about this? And then it was late at night and I was like, I'm just going to put it on Facebook because I love it. Um, and then the publicist was really, she, was like, she liked it too after that's I so did great. it. so great. So I don't think a publicist would say, oh, definitely do an unboxing video in your pajamas where you, where you throw bubble wrap at the fireplace with glee and abandon. <laughs> but this is, this leads me to, I think, well, just as you lead us through the book to seek the gifts of Hecate, or at least to experience, it's a glimpse into the gifts of journeying with her through the cave it's the return right it's the emergence and you you write near the end that you know humans are programmed to seek the transcendent and that sort of leads us into the chapter of the reborn queen so how would you describe some of the gifts uh and rewards that people could hope for or might expect um as we emerge from hecate's cave after journeying with her Oh, I, well, for me, it's about finding that sense of wholeness, like that you are, it's acceptance of the past, it's an embracing of all of yourselves, and you know, like to use some IFS language, um, it's Internal Living. family systems for listeners who yes. don't know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I was just about to do that. I was like, so oh, sorry. We, we need to do like the two minute IFS explanation. <laughs> just Google it, internal family systems. It'll help. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's from living from the center of our being. And it's that sense of being like safe in your own skin, even when the environment around you is not safe, mm. that you are on your own side, that, um, you know, like, beloved, I am here for you, you know, which I think is a comes from a Buddhist teacher, but I forget who it is now. But you know, it's like, but when you say beloved, I am here for you, you're saying that to yourself, all of yourselves, we are in this together. 
and we are working to be safe and whole and wise mind, you know, to borrow from dialectical behavior therapy, you know, we have that wise mind mm -hmm. where we're making the decisions that are in our best interest mm -hmm. and working on developing secure attachment, of course, because many of us who have significant trauma um, have a really have a difficult, huge difficulty trusting anyone else because of our early childhood um, adverse experiences. So to be the reborn queen, the reborn core um, is to emerge like Persephone from our time intentionally in the underworld of Hecate's cave, you know, conversing with our shadow with love and acceptance and not trying to kill our shadow, but to tame it by listening to it and learning from it um, to re it is that sense of being who you are and and just being safe in your own skin. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would like to end on, so we always have the same last question, but we've heard how you cope with grief and rage in your first time on the podcast. We've heard the second time where you're finding joy. This time I'd love to end by hearing, where are you finding the transcendent these days, Cindy? Where do I find the transcendent these days? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. So I mentioned earlier that I have this hot tub and I call it my cauldron. So I have a very transcendent, deep experience with this hot tub. Um, it is obviously a luxury item. Um, I live very simply. My house is very simple, but I do have this really nice barn structure built on the back the side of my house that is very lovely. It's the mess. It's it's the it, you know it is like the rest of the house is good, and then you go out there and it's like oh, and I call it Hecate's porch, and you know because that's her role as Propylaea and so on. The, the titles associated with gates and threshold. It can also be translated as porch, right? Mm. So I call it Hecate's porch. And for me, um, I soak in that, you know, I have my sacred smoke and my candles, there's a whole thing. And just something about being so in that water uh, where I do have so much chronic pain, mm -hmm. that being in that water and I'm short, so I can actually like spread all the way out like I'm in Shavasana, you know, like mm -hmm. laying flat corpse pose in mm -hmm. this hot tub and float. Wow. I'm just and, imagining you being alchemized in the cauldron, Hecate's yes. cauldron, that, that yes. somebody else would be like, oh, she's having a little hot tub, but you're but actually me, involved I'm out there in with this the deep alchemical And I'm floating process. and, you know, I'm chanting and I'm just transcending, um, listening to music. Um, there's this song by Alanis Morissette called Her. I don't know. Do you know that song? I don't think I know. It's it. so transcendent. You'll love it. Okay. And, um, I think the the most potent transcendent experience I've had in recent memories was just listening to that song on repeat and really connecting to that energy in the hot tub and just letting go of that self-consciousness, you know, that sense of self and just being in the flow of the moment and connecting to um, the spirits of the land. Um, for me, that's so important to call the elements, to honor the elements and just feel that connection. Um, and, you know, of, you know, like looking over the Atlantic with the woods around and just, I live in a fairly wild place. It's not overly civilized. So for me, that experience is just so transcendent. Um, and then it's also just those little moments, you know, like when we had that eclipse, that lunar eclipse recently, I don't know. I was just up super early and standing in the middle of the little one lane road that we live on trying to get pit pictures and see the eclipse. And I had been quite, I had a rough bout of COVID because, and then I'd get bitten by a brown recluse spider. So I had a really rough year physic. Oh, it was, yeah, I was, anyway, it was a bad year physically. Mm -hmm. Things happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I had still really been struggling with like the fatigue and everything of that. Cause I had said, you know, it'll take you months to recover from this brown recluse spider bite. Cause I had necrotized, it, it was necrotized. Oh, wow. It was a mess. Jesus. Um, and uh, so then that moment when I was just really experiencing that lunar eclipse, like I came back, I was, it was transcendent. I came back in and I was changed. Mm 
Mm. I haven't been nearly so fatigued since. Wow. Um, so yeah, that's where I find the transcendent. And then of course I have, you know, like with my students, we do our rituals. And so I get to kind of have this secondary transcendent experience where I guide them through deeper practices. Um, and I have those experiences too, but I'm very much like, you know, m making sure things are going well for them and being the leader. So that's transcendent, but, but definitely the cauldron and the moon. I think the cauldron and the moon always will be my source of transcendence. Oh, I'm never going to have a hot tub in the same way again. I mean, I firmly believe in overlaying the spiritual on our daily tasks and, and ritualizing them. But that one, that is very compelling. It's the cauldron. It's, it's very alluring. Cauldron. Yeah, I want to get in the cauldron for sure. Right? Alchemize. Yeah, transform me. Thank you so much for sharing um, about your book and, um, and also for, you know, brave, I, I know I'm asking you questions about like, uh, you know, where would you place your work among some of the great minds of the last century of psychotherapy? It's like, you know, it's kind of a big ask to ask you to do that, but I really appreciate you going there because, um, you know, it's like, we're standing in the future and calling the present to us. And I'm, I'm really hoping that, um, it doesn't take too long for, the masses to recognize where you are in the in the order of things with um with this kind of work with the psycho spiritual lineage it's been so important to me personally i'm sure i you know speak for many your students and readers um thank you from the bottom of my heart for being brave and um stepping in with hecate and and revealing her to us thank you thank you so much and hail hecate